Welcome to Introduction to Raw Pharma and the Potential of Xylucoplan for the Treatment of Immune-Mediated Necrotizing Myopathy. Hi, my name is Jerry Williams and I am the Founder and President of Myositis Support and Understanding and your host for the evening. Myositis Support and Understanding is an all-volunteer, patient-led 501c3 nonprofit empowering the myositis community. One of the ways we do this is through sessions just like this providing you with information, education, and the context needed about research and our partnerships, and providing you with the opportunities to ask questions of those who can provide you with the best answers. Tonight is no different. There will be time for questions a little later. Tonight, we welcome Roth Pharmaceuticals for a presentation and discussion about the phase two clinical trial of Xylucoplan for the treatment of immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy, IMNM, sometimes referred to as autoimmune necrotizing myopathy, NAM. Joining us is Ben Matus, Senior Clinical Trial Manager, and Ramin Fazenafar, Chief Medical Officer of Ra Pharmaceuticals. First of all, I'd just like to start by thanking Jerry and my side of support for uh, hosting this webinar this evening. Uh, we will be making some uh, forward-looking statements, and you can see the, the details of that. Um, on the second slide, which I'm not going to go through in detail. And so, without further ado, um, what we'd like to do this evening is uh, introduce you to Ra Pharma, tell you a little bit about the company uh, and our areas of focus. And then, in particular, towards the, the second part of the presentation, we'd like to update you on a, a new program that we're very excited about launching, uh, and that's a new clinical trial. Uh, in patients with IMNM, so that's immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. Um, many of you may know it uh, as NAM or just necrotizing myopathy, and we'll go into the, uh, the details of exactly the kind of um, patients that, are, uh, that we have in mind for this kind of study and, and what we think we might be able to show. Um, before that, I'd like to just uh, give you a little bit of a background into the company. You can see here, hopefully, uh, everyone's following the slides along. Um, on uh, slide four, quick overview of, of Ra Pharma. Uh, as you can see, we were incorporated in uh, 2008, and we're located uh, here in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, just across the river from uh, the Mass General Hospital, MGH, which is where the technology that started the company was founded uh, by Doug Trico, who's our CEO, and our co-founder, uh, Jack Shostak, who won the Nobel Prize for Medicine back in 2009. Um, we're a, a small growing biotech company, about 75 employees at the moment, and you can see a, a photograph there of uh, many of us at uh, a recent Rare Disease Day event uh, that we had uh, here on the campus. And uh, we have really a, one area of uh, intense focus, which forms the basis of all of our scientific research uh, and all of our clinical trials, uh, including the one that we'll discuss today in, in um, necrotizing myopathy. And uh, in particular, that is a part of the immune system called the complement system, uh, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. That is a... An, uh, an aspect, a, a part of the immune system that exists throughout nature in, uh, in many different species, and uh, it has evolved to help us fight infection over many millions of years. But when the complement system goes wrong or it is inappropriately activated or it starts attacking our own tissues or our own organs instead of just helping us to attack uh, invading pathogens like bacteria or viruses, that's how you can get autoimmune disease. Um, and there are many, many autoimmune diseases uh, which are caused or um, worsened by activation of the complement system. And so our area of focus is to develop medicines that can act on this pathway and relieve, uh, reduce, prevent, or reverse the symptoms of these autoimmune diseases that are driven by the complement system. And uh, necrotizing myopathy, we think, 
uh, is certainly one of those, and that's why we're very eager to be uh, testing this concept in a, in a clinical trial, which is just about to begin. Um, I will add that a, an important part of our company's philosophy, um, beyond just the science of discovering new medicines and uh, bringing them to market, is also to try and make them as accessible as possible. And you'll hear more about that later in the presentation, but both in terms of how we think about uh, eventually commercializing products uh, and also maximizing the convenience for patients. Um, these, are, these, are, these are topics that we think about all the time. And in particular with uh, the program you're about to hear about, uh, you'll see how we've tried to design something that um, is not just scientifically sophisticated and hopefully um, will be able to provide benefit, but also designed to be as, as convenient as possible in terms of uh, being able to use these medicines in, in daily life with as little disruption as possible. So on this slide, you can see what, what we call our pipeline slide. Uh, many biotech companies have a, uh, a picture like this somewhere on their website. And what it does is just give you a snapshot of all the different clinical trials that we're running at a given time uh, and uh, which disease areas we're focused on. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but just to focus you on the, on the top half of the slide, our lead program and our, our lead product is called Xylucaplan. That's the medicine we'll be discussing today. And as I mentioned earlier, it's designed to act on the complement system, and in particular, the component of the complement system that it impacts is called C5. In the top left corner here, we have a list of all our programs which are focused on inhibition, so that's blocking the activity of complement C5. And then going from left to right, you get a sense for how advanced these programs are. And for those of you who are familiar with clinical trials, or maybe you've even participated in clinical trials before, you'll know that there is a, a fairly standard way of, of developing these medicines, beginning with what we call the preclinical phase. That tends to be mostly um, experiments, either in the lab or in test tubes or um, some uh, animal model testing. And then we go into human clinical trials, which typically go through phase one phase two, phase three, uh, gradually increasing in size, with phase three usually being the last step before uh, a new drug could be submitted to the FDA for approval to be marketed. And so just to, to give you a feel for the areas we're working on, uh, the very top line you can see that is our most advanced program, uh, and that is the development of Zaluka plan for myasthenia gravis, generalized myasthenia gravis, or GMG. And that's a program which uh, is, is quite far along at this point. Um, it's already in a phase three clinical trial, which is ongoing. That's a worldwide study, uh, both uh, in the US and in Europe, um, as well as in Japan. And uh, the fact that that's in phase three means that we've already done a phase two trial there, and I'll show you some of that data in a moment. Um, I'm not sure in terms of everyone who's participating in the call today, whether you're familiar with myasthenia. Uh, it is a distinct disease. It's not one of the inflammatory myopathies. It's not a myositis in the sense that the, the muscle itself is not uh, fully inflamed, but it is a disease of the neuromuscular junction. So it's closely related to entities like um, IMNM or NAM and has a lot of the same uh, biological causes in terms of autoantibodies which, which cause the disease. And that's one reason that we think that a drug that works well in myasthenia, which Zalucoplan already uh, has shown, should have potential to uh, have, a, have a good effect in a disease like IMNM, and I'll, I'll take you through that in a moment. Um, just to round this out, more recently, we announced a collaboration with the Healy Center, based here in Boston, to uh, start a trial 
what we call a platform trial, where we'll be one of several companies working with the Healy Center to test the Luca plan in patients with ALS, uh, also known as motor neuron disease or sometimes Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, probably one that's familiar to, to most people. We've done a number of other smaller trials um, and some phase one studies of, uh, in, in different populations. And then we have a portfolio of other complement uh, medicines earlier in the pipeline. These are not yet in human testing. One of them, for example, acts on a different part of the complement system called factor D. I won't be saying much more about that today. Um, but our focus today will be the second line on this slide, which is the uh, phase two study for IMNM. And you can see here it says the phase two is planned. Uh, I would say we're uh, very close now to actually beginning uh, dosing of patients in that study. So hopefully very soon we'll be able to uh, to switch that from planned to ongoing. And um, certainly want to make as many patients out there who are eligible or interested in finding out more about this trial uh, aware that it's ongoing and where they might be able to find more information. And we'll get to that towards the end. Okay, so it's so a little bit more about some of our science and our um, our lead molecules, the leukoplan. This slide looks uh, complicated. I'm not going to go through it uh, line by line, but it's really just to make the point that the complement system, as I mentioned earlier, is a uh, a very consistently evolved aspect of the immune system that was designed originally to help us fight infections, to fight viruses, parasites, bacteria. And it consists of about a dozen or more proteins that circulate in the blood. We all have these proteins numbered from C1 all the way through to C9. Uh, and you can measure them uh, in, in the serum, in, in everybody. And most of the time, uh, they're just patrolling not really active, not doing anything. When we get infected with a, a, a bacteria or a virus, then the system can be activated, and that's what's shown on the, on the top panels here. It can be activated directly by the bacteria or by the surface of a pathogen, or it can be activated by antibodies, which we might raise as part of an immune response to an invading pathogen. And regardless of exactly what the immune system is recognizing and what initiates the activation of this series of proteins, they all converge on this key protein C5, which is shown in the middle of the slide. And that molecule C5, when it's activated, splits into two parts called C5A and C5B. And you can see that split uh, event happening in the, in the middle of the slide here. I don't know if I have a, I don't think I have a cursor. But hopefully you can see that where C5 is splitting into C5A and C5B. C5A is a very powerful molecule for attracting inflammatory cells. So C5 on its own, thank you, yeah, there's a cursor on C5. So C5 on its own really is, is quite inert. It doesn't do anything. But when it splits into C5A and C5B, the C5A part will attract a whole bunch of inflammatory cells into the area uh, of tissue damage. And C5B, uh, we think, is even more damaging. What C5B does is it then recruits uh, a series of other proteins, C6, 7, 8, and 9. And all of those together combine together to form uh, a very large, almost like a drill-like structure. You can think of it as a molecular drill called the membrane attack complex. And again, that evolved to very efficiently be able to kill bacteria by poking a hole uh, in their surface membrane. It's very good at doing that. But when it goes wrong, as shown on the right-hand panel where you see the different kinds of diseases where complement is involved, you start having this drill forming on the neuromuscular junction or on the muscle cells in myositis. Uh, we think it's happening in the nerve cells in ALS. It can sometimes happen in blood disorders and cause red blood cells to burst. Um, and the consistent message here is that this membrane attack complex is a very powerful uh, 
damager of tissue. And it's all well and good when it's doing that appropriately on invading bacteria. But when it turns against your own body in the form of an autoimmune disease, it can really wreak havoc. And we think that it's involved not just in the diseases listed on the right here, all of which uh, are part of our current clinical trial program, but probably one or two more dozen other diseases where um, this kind of approach could be helpful in terms of inhibiting this key C5 molecule. Just in the, the lower part of the slide, I just want to point out a couple of things. The molecule itself is a very uh, novel design. This is part of the technology that originally um, led to the founding of Ra Pharma, and it involves uh, these peptides, cyclic peptides, and you can see the blue cartoon there, the way this molecule is made. It's 15 amino acids which are connected together in a ring structure, and then they're attached to um, another chemical entity that prolongs the half-life so that after you've dosed with this drug, it hangs around long enough to have a, a, a good biological effect. And the way it's administered is shown in the bottom left corner. Uh, this is a very simple once daily subcutaneous injection, very similar to insulin. So if anybody out there is diabetic or if you have um, family members or friends who may be diabetic, you'll be familiar with this kind of dosing. Uh, it's a very quick five to eight second push. Uh, small volume, typically about half a mil uh, is is injected under the skin. Um, there's no need for hospital visits or clinic visits. This is a drug you can administer in the privacy of your own home. Um, and it's really designed for, for maximum convenience and, and minimum impact on, on patient's lifestyle. And so just to, to round that out on slide eight, you can see kind of how we think about just the, the patient experience uh, as we're developing a medicine like this through clinical trials. Um, so just a few highlights here, as I mentioned, the injection time is very short, about, about five, maybe up to eight seconds at most. We're using an injection device called the BD UltraSafe Plus. This has been used, I think, in something like 50 or more approved products. So it has a very long track record. We're not, um, not trying to use any kind of newfangled injection device. We're using something that's that's well proven and has been used by many, many patients over the years with many different, uh, in many different disease contexts. Uh, the volume is small, it's a, a fraction of the volume that, that you would have in a thimble. And this approach towards subcutaneous dosing, um, I think not just improves uh, privacy, but also increases the freedom to travel. Um, we've had patients in our clinical trials who uh, once they're on, um, once they're on the study and are, and are receiving supplies of this, are able to go away for the weekend and take, you know, three or four syringes, depending on how long they're going, and just continue to dose um, despite traveling without any interruption, without having to arrange a clinic visit or a doctor's visit in whatever their destination is. So we like to think of it as a as being designed for everyday control, almost like making it part of the daily routine, like brushing your teeth or an insulin injection. Um, you know, for patients for whom this may be useful, they would just add this additional uh, few seconds to their day, and um, then they're good to go. I'm happy to address any questions about that at the end. So I just wanna switch gears now for a moment and um, show you what we already know about this, uh, this product from other clinical trials, and in particular, I'd like to focus on the phase two trial in myasthenia gravis that I mentioned, because we do think that's probably the closest disease to the inflammatory uh, myositis group of diseases that we'll be tackling next with the IMNM trial. They have a lot of similar biological features in terms of what initiates the disease and what keeps it going. So these are the results of a, of a clinical trial that we uh, ran over the last couple of years, and uh, we presented the final data here uh, back in the spring at the American Academy of Neurology meeting. Um, not going to go in detail through the trial design other than to say that, as, uh, as some of you may know, in most clinical trials these days, to um, 
really make them robust in terms of understanding the effect of a, of a new drug, we test them against a placebo. And so a, a placebo agent would be one that, as you saw on the previous slide, the syringe, um, everything would look exactly the same, the volume, the injection. It's designed to look identical to the real drug, uh, except it isn't the real drug, it's just um, sugar water or, or, or salt water, an inert substance that doesn't have any active drug. And then patients in these clinical trials typically uh, not just the patients, but also the, the physicians who are enrolling them, um, and in fact, everybody involved with the, with the study is not aware of whether a particular patient is receiving the real drug or the active drug, or if they're receiving the placebo. And you only find out at the very end after kind of all the measurements have been made. And that's believed to be the most stringent way to test whether a new drug uh, really has a meaningful effect. And that's what we call a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. So double-blind means both the patients and the physicians are unaware of who's getting what. And it's randomized, which means it's the play of chance at the beginning that determines whether you get the placebo or the active. Um, and then what we've, tend, what we've always done, and we've done in this trial, and we'll certainly be doing in the, in the, in the um, IMNM study, is that after the period where the drug is tested against placebo, then everyone who participated um, has the opportunity to continue and receive the active drug. So even those who may have been randomized or allocated to the placebo arm at the beginning and may not have achieved a full benefit for that reason are then able to move on to, the, to receive the active drug if they wish to do so and if their, if their physician uh, agrees that it would be in their interest to do so. And so that's an option that we always provide in our clinical trials, um, and we'll be doing that in the, in the IMNM trial, as, as Ben will explain in a moment. So what you're looking at here is the top-line results, the main results from our Phase two study in myasthenia, and you can see two graphs here, one on top, one on bottom. Um, they're both measuring similar things. Um, they both measure the strength, the muscle strength of patients with myasthenia uh, over a period of 12 weeks. That's the first half of the graph. And then another 12 weeks through to week 24, that's the period where everybody receives the active drug. And the difference between the top and the bottom is you're just looking at two different scales for measuring strength. So one is called the QMG scale. That's the quantitative myasthenia gravis scale. And the lower one is called MGADL. ADL stands for activities of daily living. But the, the way to think about this is these are both measures of how well a myasthenia patient is doing. And when you look at the, uh, the graphs here, uh, a downward deflection, the, the faster and further the graphs go down is a measure of improvement. So down is good, um, up is bad. And so what you're seeing in the first 12 weeks the placebo shown in blue does have a bit of an improvement compared to where they start. So even the blue lines come down, which means there is some placebo effect in myasthenia. That's not surprising. We've seen it, and many others who've run clinical trials have seen something similar. But then if you look at the red line, um, just on the top panel, you'll see that very quickly it starts to separate from the blue line, which means the patients who are receiving the active drug were already, even after one week, doing somewhat better than the placebo patients. And then over time, that gap between the red and the blue just increases. And by the time you get to 12 weeks, um, based on how these scales are measured, that is quite a large, meaningful improvement. And then we have some statistical tests that also indicate that it, it kind of meets the bar for statistical significance, which means this is a real finding. And even in this most sophisticated, stringent, randomized, double-blind clinical trial design, Zalucoplan is showing an improvement in myasthenia patients compared to placebo. And then after week 12, you can see that the red line, the patients that got the active from the beginning, continue to do well. In fact, maybe if anything, they even improve a little bit more from week 12 to week 24. But uh, more importantly than that, the placebo patients 
who in the first 12 weeks just had a small placebo effect but didn't really get the benefit of the drug because they were receiving the, the, um, you know, the inert substance. After week 12, when they get the active drug, you can see a big improvement there between week 12 and week 13, and you see that on, on, both, uh, on both scales. And that indicates, again, that um, this goes beyond a placebo effect. This is a molecule that's really doing something uh, to the disease beyond just what you would get from just the, the fact of being in a clinical trial. So um, you know, we and I think others in the field see this as very strong data in MG, and that's been part of the impetus for us to proceed into the phase three trial, which I mentioned at the beginning is already uh, ongoing. I have another slide, slide 11, which is almost identical to slide 10. I'm not going to explain the whole thing again, other than to say these are two more scales that are used in, in myasthenia. It turns out there are four different ways of measuring muscle strength. So in addition to the ones you saw on the previous slide, now we have the MG composite scale on the top and uh, the MG quality of life 15 scale on the bottom. But the important message here is that, again, regardless of exactly how you measure improvement, we see the same pattern, that the drug is beating placebo consistently. Uh, it's doing so with quite a significant separation that's both statistically significant and certainly clinically meaningful. And that improvement is sustained over time. And again, as you can see, once more, when the placebo patients in blue roll over to get the active drug in the salmon pink color, there's another big improvement indicating that it really is the drug that's doing something beyond what a matching placebo can do. Finally, I just want to talk a little bit about safety and tolerability. Whenever we're running clinical trials, there are two sides to the coin. You want to, first of all, make sure that the drug is, is working on the disease. That's obviously without that, there's, there's nothing really to, to talk about. Um, but then at the same time, even if you have a drug that works or is having an encouraging effect in clinical trials, you also um, need to show and you want to, to prove that it's uh, well tolerated, that patients are able to, to take it, um, that it doesn't have major side effects that are causing patients to stop or, or unable to continue dosing. Um, and that's broadly what we, we think of as being safety and tolerability. And so what you're seeing here on slide 12 is the, uh, the table of adverse events from the myasthenia trial, which is the, the largest trial we've completed uh, so far. And you can see here three columns that show the placebo, the low dose of zelucoplan that we tested, and a higher dose. And then on the left, you can see the various different kinds of adverse events. An adverse event is really any kind of, uh, well, it's exact, exactly what it says. Any untoward event that happens to a patient during a clinical trial um, does not have to be related to the study drug. In fact, more often than not, it's not related to the study drug. It may be related to the disease itself, in this case, myasthenia. It could be related to some other medication. Um, the whole you know, every possibility is, um, is considered. But at the end of the trial, again, remember, this was a blinded trial, so nobody knew what they were receiving. They just report the uh, events as they happen. So we were able to make a, a table like this to compare the rates of adverse events in the placebo arm on the left with the active drug arm in the other two columns. And overall, as you can see here, again, I'm not, I won't go through the, all the numbers on the slide, but you can see the adverse events are generally well balanced. There isn't um, a substantial increase or uptake in adverse events in the active arms as compared to the placebo arm. And importantly, when we look at uh, serious adverse events, so these are ones that would cause a patient to be hospitalized, um, there were none, none of those events that were related to the study drug. And then you can see some common, the more common commonly reported events in the bottom half of the slide. Um, importantly, again, with respect to the subcutaneous dosing, the injection sites uh, were very well tolerated. We, uh, I don't think to this day, we've never had a patient who's not been able to do the subcutaneous injections or has um, had to come off a study for anything related to tolerability. The, the skin tolerability profile of this um, product is, is very good. And just uh, to round out at the bottom, there are a few more bullet points. 
uh, all of the 44 subjects in this trial completed the full 12 week study. We had no early withdrawals, which again is generally a sign that the patients are able to, to do the dosing uh, and are not having any significant problems with it. I will also mention that we saw no meningococcal infections. That's something we think about in the context of complement inhibitors, which are generally historically uh, have been very safe in clinical trials. Um, and also for those that are on the market have been very safe uh, in, in the commercial world. But there is a theoretical risk of increased risk of meningococcal infection. And so we pay great attention to that. We've not seen a single instance of it, either in this trial or in any of our other trials. Uh, but for that reason, we do require that patients that enter any of our clinical trials um, undergo a standard vaccination for meningococcus. And that's similar to the one that um, most college students are getting these days as a, as a mandatory part of, um, of entering college. Okay, um, just a quick time check. So, so in the next few slides, I want to talk about IMNM. Um, necrotizing myopathy or immune mediated necrotizing myopathy, which is um, very much the, the, the theme of the day and the, the clinical trial that will be kicking off imminently. And there may be a little more detail here than, than we need, so I'll, I'll go a little bit faster. I think to this audience, I don't need to um, belabor too much the relationship between the different uh, idiopathic inflammatory myopathies. But this is a very simple slide that kind of shows you how we think about this first clinical trial. Um, there are, of course, a whole family of, of these uh, inflammatory muscle diseases that include inclusion body myositis, they include uh, dermatomyositis, the synthetase syndrome, uh, but we're focused for the time being only on IMNM. And within that, we really are looking for uh, or looking to um, target for this clinical trial patients that have a positive autoantibody. Um, and I think if you, if you are an IMNM patient out there, you probably will know, I would, I would guess in many cases, um, you would know or you may have been told that you're antibody positive. And there are in fact two antibodies that uh, are relevant here. One is called SRP and one is called HMG-CoA reductase. It's a long name sometimes just shortened to HMGCR. Um, but what we're really going for here in the, in the first study is patients with a diagnosis of IMNM uh, who have one or other of these two autoantibodies. And it's hard to get exact numbers, but we think there are probably around 6,000 patients uh, that have this in the US at the moment and probably another 6,000 in Europe, um, a little bit fewer than that uh, in Japan. Um, but it's, uh, so this is what we would consider a, a rare disease. It's certainly in the rare disease category, but it's not ultra rare. And I think with increasing availability of these antibody tests, and now hopefully with increasing visibility of a clinical trial and at least um, one drug in development, uh, perhaps there'll be even a, a further increase in identification of these cases as uh, neurologists and, and rheumatologists have become more aware of it and it's more front of, front of mind. The, the way this presents is mostly very similar to other kinds of myositis. Um, so typically muscle weakness in the proximal limbs, the, the classic difficulty in rising from a seated position or climbing stairs, uh, brushing hair, all of those classic symptoms that, that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, an elevated serum CK levels, creatine kinase level is, is always present. And then unlike diseases like dermatomyositis where there may be some quite significant skin manifestations or rashes, in general patients with IMNM don't have uh, a lot of skin bindings. It's mostly restricted to the muscle itself. Uh, occasionally there can be some, uh, some mild lung changes. And um, I think the only other point to note is that for those who have the HMG-CR antibody, there is a relationship with previous use of statins, um, which you know, many, many thousands, millions of people around the world have taken for high cholesterol. In a very small number of those, it does seem to be associated with the onset of, of IMNM with those, um, that particular antibody. And this is what we think is going on in the muscle cell, these antibodies which are the, the Y-shaped structure shown at the top of the left-hand panel. These are 
landing on top of the muscle cell inappropriately. They shouldn't be there, but they are. And once they're there, the complement cascade just does what it's supposed to do, which is uh, it's being told that these antibodies are here, and so this thing must be a bacteria, and it needs to activate C5 and create that membrane attack complex, that molecular drill, which then lands on the surface of the cell and essentially results in that cell dying. Um, holes are poked in it. It loses its integrity. The CK that's inside the muscle cell spills out into the bloodstream, and that's how we're able to measure CK uh, in the blood as a useful measurement of uh, disease activity. Um, and that, yeah, as far as the complement cascade is concerned, that muscle cell is a bacteria and needs to be attacked. Uh, and it's, it's all happening because of those antibodies that, um, that we mentioned on the previous slide. And so you can see that, again, with C, the critical role of C5, uh, we're hopeful that by being able to um, use a, a drug to in, bind to C5 and inhibit it, prevent that splitting to C5A and C5B, we may be able to turn off this process of the muscle cells being attacked and dying. And on slide 17, we have some of the experimental uh, evidence from biopsy samples. That's shown at the top. These are uh, human biopsy specimens which have been stained. They've been colored specifically to detect that C5 B to 9 membrane attack complex, the molecular drill that I mentioned. That's what's lighting up in that bright orange color in those panels uh, A, B, and C. And that's telling you that in this muscle tissue, in these patients, there is a lot of uh, complement activation where there really should be none. And this is a very consistent finding um, in necrotizing myopathy. It's, it's almost always present. And that strongly indicates to us that, that this is a complement-mediated disease or a disease where complement is playing a key role. And we do have some experiments that back that up. That's shown in the lower panel, where we've, uh, with some collaborators in France, um, we're working to do experiments like this. This is a published uh, example from early in, uh, earlier this year, showing that the antibodies from patients, if you inject them into mice, result in those mice becoming weak. That's an important finding because it tells you that the antibodies uh, are not just a marker of the disease, but they're really causing the disease. They're causing the, the muscle damage. And then if you try to do that same thing on a mouse that has had its complement system genetically inactivated, you're then unable to make those mice uh, demonstrate weakness. They remain, uh, they retain their normal strength. And that's really strongly indicating that, yes, the antibodies are the cause of the disease, but over and above that, the way they cause the disease is through the, through the activation of the complement system, as we discussed on, on the previous slide, which is kind of more the cartoon form, and then the experimental evidence for it is um, on slide 17. I think this is the last slide um, before I hand over to Ben to talk about the trial, but we've done some, uh, we've started to do some research to understand what the experience of patients is at the moment uh, with IMNM. And um, I think probably the most important thing to say is there are no drugs approved for this condition. So the FDA has never approved a drug. Um, we're hoping that we could be the first. But uh, until then, it's really a, a, a gamish of all the other kind of standard rheumatology and neurology drugs that are used for other autoimmune diseases. And there isn't a whole lot of strong evidence to know exactly what is the best way to treat this disease because there, um, there truthfully haven't been many um, well-controlled, well-designed clinical trials to understand what the best options are. So um, from what we see from surveying the data, it seems like many patients receive some kind of corticosteroid. That's not surprising. Um, those drugs have a lot of well-known, both short-term and long-term side effects, and uh, certainly high-dose uh, steroids is not something that, that I think most patients like to be on with good reason. And so then there is the option of other immunosuppressives, some of them listed here, um, rituximab, IVIG uh, in centers that are able to provide it is probably the best thing that's, um, that's been tested so far. But... Um, from what we can see in the literature, we think about a half to maybe up to two thirds of patients, even despite all of these current therapies, 
um, have either worsened or have not improved uh, within the first couple of years. And so we do think there's a, a lot of unmet need here and a lot of room uh, for something that would be better uh, and that could potentially go on top of these existing therapies, but um, drive patients to a more stable level in terms of um, the, the attack on the muscle cells. And I think depending on where you live and how you got diagnosed, you may have a rheumatologist looking after you, you may have a neurologist, you may have both. Um, you may have a neuromuscular specialist. Sometimes this can be misdiagnosed uh, as other things. Um, but importantly, I think if, uh, if we come back to those antibodies, that is really the critical test here. If you have one of those two antibodies and you have, an, you have a muscle disease, um, it's really kind of uh, clear that it, it's IMNM and it really can't be anything else. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Ben Mattis, who's our clinical uh, lead for the IMNM Phase 2 study, and he's going to tell you about the trial design and some of the sites and locations. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, so like Ramin said, I'm Ben Mattis. I'm the clinical operations lead or trial manager for this study at RA. Uh, we are conducting a Phase 2, two study to evaluate the potential of the Zyluka plan for the treatment of IMNM. We're looking to enroll 24 patients um, in, in centers across the world. Um, the initial visit for a patient that is interested in participating in the study uh, will include the doctor assessing whether or not they meet the eligibility for the study. Some key entry criteria for the study are uh, the clinical diagnosis of IMNM, uh, autoantibody status, being either HMPCR or SRP, and then creatine kinase, creatine kinase or CK levels above 1,000. Upon determining that the patient is eligible, um, they will be enrolled into the study. At that point, the participant will be randomized to either receive Zylucoplan or uh, placebo in a blinded manner. I know we went over this earlier. Um, so really the key is that everyone is blinded to the treatment, whether it's the patient, the doctor, us at Raw Pharma as well. And you know that's really the best scientific way to study whether or not the drug is working. Um, it's also important to note that participants will be able to continue to receive whatever their standard of care at the time is. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, and there will be an eight week study treatment period where the par participants will dose themselves once a day and complete five study visits at their site. At the end of the eight week treatment period, all study participants will have the option to receive Zyluka plan as part of a long term extension study. The primary endpoint uh, of measure for this study is going to be CK levels. Um, as Ramin went over in a, a few slides ago, is you know CK really shows the breakdown of that muscle tissue, um, and so that's the measure we're looking at for the for for the primary endpoint. Uh, this slide ju just shows uh, the, the, where we're going to be running the trial. We're going to be in 18 centers worldwide, including the U.S., Netherlands, U.K., and France. Um, there's going to be 14 sites located around the U.S., and we're also supporting patient, tra patient travel reimbursement. Um, so, you know, although it may not be, a, a site might not be a short drive away for for all of our subjects were willing to you know, work with subjects to come up with something that would work for them as far as travel goes. Uh, and we can be contacted at trials at rawpharma.com for any questions about the study, any questions about the trial sites um, or locations. So I think that's, that's our presentation. So we'd be you know, open, open up for questions if there are any. Thanks so much, Ben. We appreciate that. <clears throat> and Ramin, thank you for your uh, presentation. It's always good to, to see some science behind all of this and to better understand. Um, my, I just have a quick question and this has come up uh, in some of our groups before and it may not really matter, but if can you test positive for anti-SRP or anti-HMGCR but not have any symptoms? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, um, I mean, in some ways that's a hypothetical because 
you know, who gets tested for those antibodies? It's already a population that's in front of a rheumatologist or a neurologist and typically will have some symptom that's led to that. Um, I think there has been some work. I think some of the labs that do these antibodies, and we, we, um, we looked at some of this data, the labs that have to make sure they're able to measure the antibodies accurately, they do go back and test in just normal, healthy, volunteer-type samples to see if they can find the antibody as a kind of false positive. Um, and the good thing is that you really don't see it with these antibodies. These are, um, these are not antibodies that you find just in the normal population just walking down the street. Um, and so I think if you have the antibody, it's, it's, it's virtually guaranteed that that's real. Now, you may have very mild symptoms, you may have very severe symptoms. I think in general with IMNM, by the time people are getting diagnosed, uh, they're probably more on the severe side. This tends to be one of the more aggressive uh, myopathies in terms of how it presents. And so the kind of CK levels that we've heard uh, about on average are typically in the seven, eight, nine thousand range. Um, now somebody could still be have relatively mild weakness, even even with a very high CK. But um, I think it's not going to be a it's not going to be a false positive. If you have the antibody, it's it's almost certainly real. Great, thank you for that. <clears throat> and one other thing is pain. Have have you tracked? Um, I'm not sure with my study of gravis if there if pain is a, a symptom or involved in that. But uh, through that study, have you found a reduction in pain as a result <clears throat> of the um, improvement? No, that's a great question. Actually, um, with uh, myasthenia, it tends to be painless because the area that's inflamed and all this complement damage is happening. It's a tiny pinpoint area in just where the nerve inserts into the muscle. The rest of the muscle is fine. Um, so for, for myasthenic patients, they tend not to have pain. Um, so yeah, I can't, I, I, we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to see. Um, and even in IMNM, I think at least the literature would say that it's quite variable. Again, patients can have a lot of inflammation and not have so much pain or have a lot of pain and have relatively um, milder inflammation on, on the biopsy or in terms of CK levels. So yeah, that's something we haven't tested yet. Okay, great. It'd be, it'd be good to, to track that if, if, you know, if it's part of the, the endpoint or part of one of those questionnaires, um, because we do find, you know, we, we provide support for numerous patients, um, online support and video support, and pain seems to be one of the biggest issues, even uh, when they, you know, have uh, when their symptoms have decreased, say with IVIG or rituxan, pain continues to be uh, a huge issue in their life. So, no, that's helpful. Thank you, and we'll um, we'll also take that back and and uh, talk to some of our investigators who've helped us design the trial and, and see if they have any any other thoughts about that. But that's certainly something we can look at. Great, thank you. Uh, who else has a question? Uh, I've got a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Ahead, Dawn. Hi. Is this is this going to be um, available for people with myasthenia gravis now, or is it just going to be in the future? Yeah. Um, thanks for the question. The we're hoping it will eventually be available. Yes, in terms of um, being available for prescription on the market, it's not available yet. For myasthenia, we're running a, currently running a phase three clinical trial. Um, and if you're interested in that, or if you know someone that's interested in that, you can certainly use the same email address, trials at Raw Pharma. Um, we have many sites in the U.S. that are enrolling in that myasthenia trial. So, yes, certainly happy to provide more information there. Um, but obviously, we have to finish that trial first uh, and then submit all of that data to the FDA. And there'll be a period of typically nine to 12 months after we do that before the drug is uh, approved by the FDA and available. So it's, it's not approved yet. Um, and the only way to participate at the moment would be through the phase three clinical trial. Okay. And is it, is it good for um, the muscle symptoms with myasthenia or is it, is it helping with some of the other symptoms for that as well? So for, for myasthenia, the main symptom is, is weakness. It's a bit different than myositis in that the muscle itself is normal. There's nothing wrong with the muscle in myasthenia. The problem in myasthenia is the communication between the nerve and the muscle breaks down. 
because the, the point at which the nerve enters the muscle um, and uh, the neurotransmitters communicate to the muscle to say you should contract now and relax now, that connection point is what's damaged. Um, and so, for example, the CK levels that we'll be measuring in IMNM, and which are very important, as you all know, in myositis, those are completely normal in, in myasthenia, even in the most severe case, because the muscle cells are fine. They're just not able to receive the signals. And so in the, the data I showed you with the improvements in the clinical trial, those are all measurements of muscle strength. Um, but what you're actually fixing isn't the muscle itself. It's the neuromuscular junction. It's where the nerve enters the muscle. Hi, I have a, this is Lynn. There's a question from Corinne about if the drug is effective for IMN uh, patients, will it also be used for patients in inpatients and, and NAM necrotizing myopathy patients without antibodies? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, okay, on the earlier slide, I mentioned that there are about, we think there are about 30% of, uh, of NM or IMNM patients that do not have one of the two antibodies and um, sometimes called seronegative, meaning you've tested the antibodies and, and you can't find them. We do think that that group is also probably has the same kind of disease in terms of the complement mechanism. Um, and so... Send me a I think if, if the first trial is positive, uh, keep in mind, then we'll be doing a phase three. We'll need to do a phase three trial if, the, if this first trial is positive. And I think at that point, we may want to consider including uh, either in that trial or in another study, um, this subset of patients who are antibody negative. Um, so we are aware of it, and we're certainly not, um, we're not dismissing that group. We, we would like to be able to uh, to include them in in the in future clinical trials, but for this first study, uh, I think we need to be very restricted in terms of making sure that that everybody has one of the antibodies because that's where we're the most certain that the complement mechanism is going to be important. And so, you know, if, if it works here, then it may well work in other places. But if it doesn't work here, then you know we don't want to go beyond those boundaries. Buster, did you have a question? I just wanted to make a comment about the pain issue. When I was at my worst point, my CK was 9,000. And I guess it was like about three months after I started the infusion, um, I could start feeling things. But during that worst part, you could literally hit me with a hammer and I wouldn't have felt it. So as the treatment, as the treatment started improving, then, then you started feeling the pain? Yes, because I, I, my wife had made a comment because I was in the rehabilitation hospital for like a month and a half. And at that point, I had already had my third infusion. And I was said, made a comment, oh, wow, that hurts. And she said, do you realize what you just said, that you actually felt that? And up until then, for 14 months, I didn't feel anything. Because it took them 14 months to figure out what I had. And when you say infusion, you mean, uh, was that IVIG? Yeah, the IVIG. Because in the beginning, I was getting... Um, like 100 grams a day over five days, every three weeks. Wow, yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. Yes. Huge dose. <laughs> like right now I'm getting, because of the IVIG outage this year, this summer I had a major flare-up. My CK shot back up um, because I missed one dose because nobody had any. And then they put me on the Gamma Guard, which my neurologist said wouldn't work for what I have. And it didn't, and my CK and everything just went crazy. But now I'm back on my the old IVIG I'm getting, and my CK is dropping. It dropped 100 points last week on my last blood work. Appreciate you sharing that, Buster. No problem. Hi everyone. I have a question. If um, Ben, would you mind answering if a patient is not located in one of these locations and is interested in participating, um, would that would there be travel assistance available or what would you recommend? Yeah, so there, we do have travel assistance as part of the study. Um, as I listed, obviously there's, there's 18 sites worldwide and 14 sites in the US, uh, but probably the best um, course of action would be to contact us at trials at rawpharma.com. And from there we could um, you know, link you up with your, the closest site to you or come up with probably the best 
place for you to, to thanks ben appreciate that i, I just wanted to make <clears throat> just one other comment on the um on the antibodies because i think a couple of other meetings we've been to with uh with patients we have heard that there may be you know there was a question earlier about being antibody negative um i think it is important if you think well if you think you have uh, necrotizing myopathy or if you know you have um to really double check that those antibodies have been tested because i think it's all it is also possible that there may be some folks out there who have the diagnosis but maybe haven't been tested with the antibodies that doesn't mean you're negative it doesn't mean you don't have the antibodies they need to be checked um and we i think just anecdotally we did we did chat with a couple of patients who um, just hadn't had the antibodies tested. That doesn't mean you're seronegative. In fact, the odds are that if the diagnosis is right, you probably do have one of the two antibodies. 70% of, of patients who have IMNM will have one of the two antibodies. So I would just encourage everybody to either find out if you've been tested or check or you know, maybe ask your physician if it's appropriate to test if it hasn't been tested. Um, that's going to be really important moving forward in terms of understanding um, you know, which which uh, which drugs and which mechanisms may be helpful. And just to add to that, um, you know, always keep, you know, with the availability of electronic charts and such, you can, you know, usually go back and look at your blood work. Uh, the myositis panel itself, the antibody panel, currently does not include the anti-HMGCR. So if your physician isn't aware that that's not a part of that panel, the anti-SRP is, but they would have to order the HMGCR separately. Uh, we have information about that, how your doctors uh, can order that test on our website, um, on our IMNM page. Yeah, that's a great point. And um, I think especially if, uh, for example, you have this kind of history of statin use and then you developed um, an inflammatory myopathy, you know, that would be a very, be a very appropriate test to, to do the HMGCR. And as, as Jerry said, it has to be sent separately at the moment. We're hoping eventually one day in the future, um, you know, it'd be great to have all these on the same panel and then at least the physicians wouldn't have to remember <laughs> to do a send an extra test. Ellen uh, has been, she has polymyositis. Um, this is related to the uh, immune uh, mediated necrotizing. Ellen, do you have one of the antibodies for that? Or has your doctor told you that it's not PM? Because that's happening a lot now. So my question is, you know, I, I don't know where to turn right now as far as treatment. You know, the toxin seems like it's kind of keeping me stable, but um, the prednisone, I cannot get lower than 10 milligrams and then I have a big flare. So now they're thinking about putting me back on methotrexate. Um, so it, it's, it's been very frustrating because I'm losing so much um, muscle in my legs and I could hardly walk anymore. So I, I, you know, I don't know. I have to get retested, or I'm not sure. I've had it for 27 years, and and this is the worst I've ever been. Yeah. Um, well, plus I'm sorry to hear that. In terms of uh, things worsening recently, um, I do think you raise a good point about polymyositis, and I do want to want to make this point generally, which is that, yeah, you know, I think if you talk to a lot of the experts these days, they, they would say that polymyositis is a term that was used, you know, a lot in the 80s and 90s. It's probably um, probably a term that eventually uh, may be retired. And the reason okay. I say that is that, you know, what, what used to be called polymyositis is probably a mixture of these other things we've talked about today, the mm -hmm. IMNM, uh, right. synthetase, um, it's probably not a final diagnosis, and so I think if you would, if you were diagnosed a long time ago with polymyositis and haven't that hasn't been re-examined, it right. may well be worth asking about uh, these antibodies because um, IMNM was always there. It's not like this is a new disease that just appeared on the planet, you know, five years ago. It's always been there. It used to be, I think, buried within. Um, this umbrella of polymyositis, but I think what we're learning now is that polymyositis isn't one disease, and it's probably right. five different things uh, mixed together. And one of those things is IMNM. Um, and so, if you if you have a diagnosis of polymyositis, particularly if it's been you know more than five uh, five years ago that the diagnosis yep. was made, 
Uh, I think it's well worth having a discussion with your physician about whether the antibody test would be appropriate. Okay. Um, now, regarding CK levels, if your CK levels are really uh, truly normal or <laughs> below normal, then um, I think, depending on what stage, it probably indicate that it's not very necrotic in terms of. I showed the cartoon earlier with the muscle cells being attacked and by the antigen yeah. by complement, and then when they burst, the CK levels go up. For the CK levels to be normal, um, probably indicates that maybe some other more maybe a more advanced stage of disease where there's some maybe fibrosis in the muscle or something else going on. But if it's uh, if it's necrosis, the CK levels should be high, and that's why for the clinical trial we do require the CK levels to be above a thousand. Right, I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I probably, I'll have to have my doctor recheck me and, and uh, take some more blood work. There are, you know, some clinical trials that are being planned for dermato and one that even includes polymyositis. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to have that checked because I, I really didn't think about that, you know, having the disease so long and not really getting checked for, you know, since 2011. Um, so like you said, you know, I'm going to have to get that rechecked and see if there's something else going on. Thanks, Ellen. Appreciate the question. Thank you. Does anybody else have a question? I got one. Sure. Hey, Jason. Hey. So if I heard this right, so if the CK levels are low, then it's, it's pretty much in, well, let's say remission. Is that, is that correct with what I was thinking of? Yeah. I mean, I think for particularly for IMNM, the relationship between the CK level and the muscle inflammation is, is um, a pretty tight relationship. And so if you've been treated and the CK levels have come down um, to normal or to near normal, that would indicate that the, the immune attack on the muscle cells has been switched off. Now that doesn't mean necessarily that you feel better right away. And there may be quite a lag. Uh, you know, the CK levels can come down very fast. CK doesn't hang around in the blood space very long. Um, if you switch off the inflammatory process, the CK could come down within uh, days or weeks, um, but it could take much longer for muscle strength to recover. Uh, and that's one reason why in our trial, although we're looking for CK at eight weeks, and we're, we're quite confident that should be long enough to see the CK come down, we will be doing this long-term extension um, hopefully to see some of the functional measurements improve. Um, and they may well take longer than eight weeks to see that. And so, yes, I think it's certainly going in the right direction if the CK is normal, but it doesn't mean that um, you're clinically going to feel the improvement as fast as the CK. The CK will always go up or down before the, uh, the symptoms. Okay. Because, I mean, the problem that I've been having is I've been stuck in the hospital for – a little over a week now and I'm going to be transferred to a skilled nursing facility on Friday and what they found out my CK levels are normal but they did an MRI on Tuesday of last week and compared it to the one one I had in April of last year and there is more muscle that has been replaced by fat in my right leg, which right now I cannot put any weight on it or anything. It's so weak. And I've got the weakness and the pain that I'm, you know, my doctor says it's not, it's not the myopathy, but I'm trying to find out. I mean, what else could it be? Is, um, do you know if you have one of these antibodies for IMNM? I have the, yeah, I have the SRP. You have SRP. Hmm. And the CK level, as you said, is still high or? No, no. I mean, it's it's in, it's in, it's within normal range. Okay. You know, because they've noticed that there is more muscle loss since April of last year until now, and a lot of my other muscles are. They didn't really say deteriorating, but more likely shrinking. So they're going to put me through some rigorous physical therapy to try to get that back. But I'm. I'm afraid that there's something that we're missing with this. Yeah, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to comment without having all the information, but I, yeah. I think in the, even in the published literature, there is 
Uh, it certainly can happen that when any of these inflammatory myopathies goes on for a long time, um, and I think I mentioned earlier during the talk, you can have some replacement with fat or fibrosis, scar, scar tissue. Um, and that process is one that uh, a drug like the one we're developing wouldn't impact. We would have to act earlier is that usually the sequence is that you have inflammation and then later that's followed by fibrosis and fatty infiltration. That's kind of a, a later stage. And so we're trying to intervene earlier to, to try and prevent that from happening. It's hard to say, you know, specifically, but I think it certainly from, from what's been published, it can be part of just the normal progression or the natural history of, of IMNM. It doesn't necessarily to be something else. Okay, I appreciate it. Sure. Thanks for the question, Jason. It looks like we have time for one more question. If uh, anybody has something that they would like to ask. Yeah, it's Buster. I have had a question. Sure. Hey, Buster. How you doing? Hey, um, I go see my neurologist tomorrow. Is there anything I should talk to her about with this? I was, they did do a muscle biopsy on me and blood work, and they sent it to the Mayo Clinic in California. And I am a HMGCR. And you said your C your CK is is normal. Back no, back right now it's eleven hundred. Oh, um, it, it dropped two hundred points in the past three months after I got back on my regular IVIG. And how about just your function, strength wise? Aside um, a lot of a lot of muscle weakness in the legs. My neurologist had told me, this is my third flare-up, and she told me that every time you have a flare-up, when you have muscle damage, most of the time, you don't get it back. So whatever damage is done, it, you don't, some of it comes back, but some of it doesn't. And that's why she always emphasized, make sure you're exercising and walking and keeping your muscle strength up so when you do have a flare, you're in a little bit better condition to not lose as much. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's interesting. You know, muscle does regenerate. It regenerates slowly. Yes. You look at, um, even when you look at biopsies of, of IMNM, even at the time of diagnosis, you see a mixture of, you know, some cells that are being attacked and are dying, some cells that are about to die, but you also do see some regenerating muscle fibers. So, yeah, you know, the body does try to keep up with this this kind of turnover, um, and I guess I would say to that that we've never really had a drug that can switch off the necrosis. So I think we don't know exactly what the recovery might look like. Right. Um, I do think, based on your description, at least from what we've just a few points you made, um, I think you would be in the kind of categories that we would be looking for in terms of this clinical trial because. You have the diagnosis, you have the right antibody, and you have a CK that's more than a thousand, and you still have some weakness, so potentially some room to improve. Um, depending on where you're located, we could certainly, I don't know, I'm not sure who your neurologist is, but if they're interested in, uh, or if you're interested and they're interested in learning more about the trial and where would be a, a nearby center, we could certainly provide well, that. Well, I live in Delaware. I'm, I'm a Delawarean like Jerry, and I'm in Wilmington, Newark, and I'm in the middle of Maryland and Philadelphia. Okay. And my neurologist is in the Christiana Care Hospital System. And she deals with a lot of myositis patients. And we could definitely put your neurologist in touch with one of our principal investigators that would be running the trial. So if you want more information about the trial, I think probably the best thing would be to, to reach out to us at trials at Raw Pharma. Um, okay. Pass along information about the trial. And then also, you know, pass along a information about an investigator so that we put put you in touch with him or your neurologist in touch with him. Yeah, is there is there anything I should bring up with her tomorrow when I go see her or ask her about this? Oh, about the about the trial? Yeah, should I talk to her about doing the trial or not? Or um, well, I think you can you you you, you can always. Um, you can always get her thoughts. I don't know if she's aware of, of us or, or kind of, you know, any of the stuff we've talked about today. Um, right. But yeah, I think in general, it's always good to talk about um, you know, whether a clinical trial would be appropriate. And then, as, as Ben mentioned, we'd be happy to, to connect with her and put her in touch with one of the investigators that are in the, 
in the trial. Yeah, so sure. just for, for everyone else listening, the way this works is, you know, the list we have here of locations, these are particular physicians that have been identified that will be investigators in the trial, recruit, recruiting patients. And so um, the way well, you would get into the trial is you'd go to see one of these neurologists and they would they would then do their own assessments and sort of determine eligibility. And so I think for you, depending on where you are geographically, um, probably either the NIH uh, in Bethesda or um, we have a site in Philadelphia, those would probably be the closest. Yeah, and I know you're going to make this this webinar public and then also uh, along the slides. So it'd probably be a good good idea to, to, to share these slides maybe with your neurologist. Yeah, because she this would be something that she would be very interested in too. She can also go to, even when you're in the clinic, if she has a moment, if you just go to rawpharma.com, that's our, that's our website. All of everything I've presented today, you can find in some form uh, okay. available on our website. We thank you for joining us this evening for introduction to raw pharma and the potential of Zylucoplan for the treatment of immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. We thank Ben and Ramin of Raw Pharmaceuticals for spending a part of their evening with us. We appreciate their time and willingness to talk directly with patients living with IMNM. We appreciate the opportunity. And we look forward to the next step in this clinical trial. And we thank you, the patients, caregivers, the general public that attended and joined us and participated. We appreciate you. Be sure to visit us online at understandingmyositis.org and check out our newest website, myositislife.org, the patient and caregiver experience. Enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. Thank you.